here. Let's start. Luke chapter number nine. Luke, I am your father. I'm sorry, Luke chapter number nine. Haven't done that in a while. Luke <laughs> chapter number nine. Woo, just in a crazy mood tonight. And uh, Luke chapter number nine. See what you did, Brother Bill? You got me in a crazy mood. That's what you did. Luke, <laughs> praise hallelujah. And uh, all righty. Luke chapter number nine. We're going to start reading in verse number 57. Go down to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus saith, said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God of God. I want to speak to you. This is the kingdom of God, part number nine. I'm going to talk to you about fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus. I'm so grateful for the opportunity you've given me to preach. Holy Spirit, give me your power, please. I need it. Lord, please give me the mind of Christ. Help me to say only that which you once said. And then I pray, dear Lord, for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And I just pray, dear Father, that you would please intervene. Just do a work that only you can do. Lord, please keep the devil away from our church. Lord, I hate the devil so much. And he always tries his best to get in the way. But I understand the promise of God's word that, that you'll build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So thank you, Lord, for that promise. And Lord, I just pray now that you'll bless this service. Let your work be accomplished. And Holy Spirit, speak to all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen fit for the kingdom of God. Now, let me ask you a question. I want you all to think about this now. Do you really want to live for God? I mean like in the depths of your heart, in the depths of your soul, do you really want to live for God? Three people in this passage came to Jesus, all wanting to follow Jesus, listen to this, if it would be easy. Don't miss this now. You ever heard the old saying, if, if, everybody, if it was easy to do, everybody would do it? You ever heard of that? Same thing for the Christian life. If it was easy to live for God, everybody would. And the fact of the matter is, it's not easy to live for God. It's, it's a challenging life. It's a, it's a life of war. It's a life of ups and downs when it comes to spiritual highs and spiritual lows. And it's not just a simple, hey, you can do this and everything's going to be great. You want to live for God? Boom, everything's awesome. No, 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 it's not that. It's not that at all. So in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57, Jesus is teaching us about what it takes to live for the kingdom of God. Now, this is going to be introduction. I'm going to give you three points, letters A, B, and C. And then for my main text, my main outline, I'm going to give you three points, one, two, and three. I just did that because I just wanted to. But anyway, uh, but look down at verse 57, and let's read it again. It came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, here's what he said. Lord, I want, I'm going to do whatever you do. Wherever you go, I'm going. Whatever you do, I'm doing. I'm following you. And in verse 58, it says, and Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. I remember years ago, I used to wonder, what is God talking about? I mean, that doesn't seem like a normal response to him saying, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And then he says that. Well, here's what he was teaching him. He, he's, he was teaching uh, about the kingdom of God in three different aspects through these three different men. So letter A, write this down. It requires a life of faith. He was saying to that man, you want to follow me? It, re it requires a life of faith. What he was saying is, all right, 
I'm in my three-year earthly ministry. I'm here doing the will of the Father. And I've got no idea where I'm going to lay my head on my, uh, where I'm going to lay my head down tonight. He said, no idea. But what he was saying is, I'm living by faith. I'm trusting that the Father is going to make a way for me to have a place to lay my head down tonight. And so, um, if you understand, 2,000 years ago in Israel, it was a little bit different than it is right now. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but it's not like, you know, the economy is the same and, you know, America, how we live in our lifestyle. It's, it's amazing. You know, those of us who are born in our country and we've only lived in America, there's some of us who have never even stepped foot outside of America on another country soil. How many of you are here tonight and you simply say, I've never been on the ground of any other country in the world other than America? If you've never been out of the country, would you raise your hand? Okay, there's several of you. So there's a possibility that you could think everybody in the world lives like we live. <laughs> like this is just normal. This is not normal. Do you know what the population of America is? About 330 million, 335 million. Something like that? Well, I guess if you count everyone that's not here legally, it might be 350 million. But anyway, uh, but somewhere in the 330 million, right? Do you know how many people are alive on planet Earth right now? A approximately almost 8 billion, right? I mean, like real close. So you know what 330 million is out of 8 billion? It's like 2%, something like that, of the world's population. The majority of the world don't live like we live. And the world back in the days of Christ definitely wasn't like America. So it was a little bit different of a scenario, a little bit different of a situation. But here's what Jesus simply said. If you want to follow me, you're going to have to live by faith with everything, even when it comes to where you lay your head down at night. And that's what Jesus was saying. If you want to follow me, it requires a life of faith. Then the second person came. And again, this seems like an odd response. He said, and he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, here's the thing. His father wasn't dead yet. Okay? This is the story. His father was getting ready to die. And so he was saying, look, my dad's going to be dying sometime soon. I want to follow you, but would you allow me to bury my father first, and then I'll come follow you. Now, look what he said. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now, that seems a little harsh, but, but here's what he was saying. Letter B, it requires a life of sacrifice. It requires a life of sacrifice. So God says, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to sacrifice. How many times have we seen in the Bible where the Bible says, whosoever follow me, let him take up his cross and follow me daily. Well, the cross is that right there, right? So that's not fun. That's not easy. That's difficult. That's hard. That's challenging. And some of us have to give up some things, which is what the cross represents, sacrifice, in order to live a life for God. And here's what God said. Look, let the dead bury their dead. What he was saying is, you know, your family's not saved. Your family doesn't believe in me. They're not interested in following me. And let them take care of those things of life. You come and preach the word. You go and preach the kingdom of God. And what he was saying is, it requires a life of sacrifice. Then the third man came up to him, and it says in verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And now, this is the key to our text, or to our sermon tonight, the, the key verse. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let her see. You want to live for God? You want to follow him in your life? Here's what it requires. Let her see. It requires a life of focus. It requires a life of focus. He says, look, if you're going to dedicate your life to me and live for me, be focused on my kingdom. Don't look back and say, oh, I, I want to go tell everybody goodbye. I want to go have a party. I, and, and by the way, you understand, in our mind, when we read these passages of Scripture, it's, it's real easy for us to think, well, the first guy came to Jesus, and he says, I want to follow you. He said, great, you're not going to have a place to sleep tonight then. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying you're not going to have a place to sleep. He was going to say, he was saying, even the place where you sleep you're going to have to live by faith and depend on, the, on my Father to help you find a place to sleep. 
You're going to have to give up the security of you taking care of everything on your own. You're going to have to, and by the way, that's, that doesn't always work out, right? I mean, how many, how many of you have ever tried to take care of everything on your own and it failed miserably, right? So that's kind of what, what, what God was saying here. <clears throat> so he was saying it's, it's a life of faith. Now, again, for the casual reader from America, you know, we could simply say, oh, what, God's saying that we can't have a place to sleep if we live for him? No, he was saying you got to live by faith. In other words, depend upon God to take care of even the basic necessities of life, like where to sleep. Then the second one, he said, hey, my father, you know, it's easy for us to think his father just died and he wants to have a funeral for him and then go live for God. What's wrong with that? Well, that's not really what happened. What happened was his father was going to die. He said, look, I'm going to have to bury my father sometime in the future, sometime soon. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year. I don't know when. So I want to live for you, but can I wait until after this event takes place? My father passing away. And Jesus basically said no. He says, if you're going to follow me, let the dead bury the dead. So what he was trying to say is, now again, that could look from us as saying, wow, that was harsh. No, what he was saying is, it requires a life of sacrifice. I remember one time um, years ago, um, uh, somebody, uh, <laughs> he, well, no, I, I'll just, I'll go on. I can give you lots of, lots of illustrations. And so, um, I'll just, this is not my main thought. So let, let's get to my main thought. Number three, then, or letter C in verse number 61, it says, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but first let me, uh, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. So you know what that thinks? You know, you think, well, man, he's just going to go by and say, hey, everybody, I'm leaving. I'm going to go follow Jesus. Goodbye. I'm going to pack my bags and get out of here. And like an hour later, he's going to be following Jesus. And, and then like, Jesus, couldn't you wait an hour? No, that, that wasn't the deal. What he was trying to say is, I want to live for you, but I also want to, I want to, you know, do things with my friends too. That's, that's exactly what he was saying. I'm double-minded. I want to live for you, but I also want to. And he said, no. He said, no man putting his hand to the plow is fit, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So here's what he was saying. He was saying it requires a life of focus, all right? So there are three things that God says. If you want to follow him, if you want to live for him, it's going to require faith, sacrifice, and focus. So in other words, it's not just the easy life. See, if you're going to live for God, it needs to be 24-7, you're living by faith. How am I going to eat tomorrow? Well, let God do that for you. Let God determine that. Um, There are things in life that I've wanted to do that they're not bad, but you're going to have to give them up because it requires a life of sacrifice. And then he said, but I've got friends, and I want to go spend time with them, and I also want to live for you. He says, no. If you're going to live for me, you have to be singularly focused on the kingdom of God. And again, he wasn't saying he can't have friends, but he was saying, focus, focus on living for me. Now, it truly is a wonderful life to live for God. Are you listening? But it would be prudent to count the cost and see if you are willing to pay the price that is necessary. A lot of people over the 27 years have come to our church and had an emotional high. Woohoo! I got saved. I got baptized. I want to live for God. I want to, this is my church. And, and then all of a sudden, in a week or two or a couple of months or a half a year, six months, the emotional high goes down and they're not riding on that emotion anymore. And then they're nowhere to be found. They, they're not living for God anymore. They're, they're, just, they're just gone. Why? Well, because a lot of times when people make a decision, I'm going to live for God. I am committing myself. I am going to follow him from now till the day I die. What happens, though, is if you don't sit down and count the cost before you make that decision, what's going to happen is you're going to run into something that you didn't expect. So let me give you an example. When I was 16 years of age, God called me to preach. He called me to pastor a church. All I knew about pastoring, this is it, when I was 16 years of age, the the entirety of what I knew about pastoring was I was going to be preaching three times a week and going soul winning and winning souls to Christ. That's it. That is it. Do you know what that that occupies my time every week? About maybe 5 or 10% of my schedule. 
and my, and my focus and my time. So me, me preaching in church and me going out soul winning is just a small portion of all the responsibilities that I have as a church, uh, as a pastor of a church. You know, there's, there's budgeting that I have to oversee. And, uh, and, and honestly, there's nobody in this church, not one person in this church, that carries the weight of the budget more than I do. Because I'm telling you, I mean, you know, when I hired, you know, Brother Josh, when I hired, you know, Brother Jerry to come work for me, and I'm going to be hiring, God willing, Brother David uh, for the first week of January. You know, they, they come here expecting to be paid. And it's not like... Every single week, we got to, you know, have a prayer meeting. Can you imagine, Brother Josh, if I called you and Jerry in on Tuesday and said, listen, let's pray for two hours and I can pay you this week. We'd be in there for a two-hour prayer meeting. Lord, help us to be able to pay them, you know. They would feel insecure. They wouldn't necessarily want to continue to work here. I mean, so, so guess who has to feel the weight of that? That's, that's me. And I have to go to God and I have to pray. And I say, God, we got approximately $36,000 a month. That has to come in the offering plate. That's our budget and the school, the Reformers Unanimous, the bus ministry, the Spanish ministry, the junior church, the, just every ministry that's, you know, the, home, the, the homeless ministry, the, I mean, every ministry, whatever it is, it adds up to about $36,000 a month. And, 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 and when I surrendered to be a preacher, I wasn't aware of that. Also, I've got to take care of problems in the church. I, I'm guessing that on an average week, I spend more time dealing with issues in the church more than anything else. Now, the issues can be relative to building issues. It could be relative to people issues. I mean, people not getting along, people needing counsel, people getting in a you know, upset with someone else or, or um, you know, then something happening in the school or, or deal, you know, just dealing with issues. And the issues are endless. I mean, they're endless. If I wanted to, I could spend 60 to 80 hours a week dealing with issues that are present in the church. Now, again, some of that issue is people. Some of the issue is the vehicles. Some of it is the building. But things, God bless you, that just simply need to be dealt with, the issues of the ministry. And I got to tell you, you know, I didn't get into the ministry to file paperwork. I probably spend about maybe six to eight hours a week on statistics, records, financial, you know, uh, uploading all, you know, I'm, I'm the treasurer of the church, so I probably spend about six to eight hours a week just dealing with statistics and numbers and and, and inputting and outputting and paying bills and, you know, sending off the missionary checks. And so six to eight hours a week I spend doing that. I had no idea that that was going to be a, a part of it when I surrendered to be a preacher. Then, ready for this? Here's the big one. The spiritual warfare that takes place in the kingdom of God. When I was 16 years of age, I had no idea how intense the devil would fight the church and would fight me and would fight my family and would, and would try to do everything he can to hinder the work of God from going forward. And I spend a lot of time during the week engaged in spiritual warfare. Now, thankfully, when I surrendered to be a preacher at age 16, I, I mean, God called me at age 16, I surrendered at age 17. I didn't just go in, become a pastor at age 18. Praise the Lord for that. Because you know what I did? I went off to Bible college. And I spent from September of 1987 to when my wife graduated, May of 1994. So actually, August of 94, because we moved here at the end of August to the beginning of September. All right? So, um, so approximately seven years, I was in a Bible college environment for, um, for five of those. I, I was graduated in four years. I took an extra year of classes, got married. My wife took two years. So for seven years, I was in a Bible college environment. And you know what that was doing? It was telling me about all of this stuff. It was preparing me for what I needed to know in order to be a pastor. And I was able to count the cost. 
and I realized this is what I want to do. You know, originally when I thought about being a pastor, I thought I'd be preaching three services a week. I'd be soul winning, winning souls to Christ. Everybody would love me. The church would grow. The bills would always be paid. Everything would be hunky-dory, and we'd just take off. <laughs> Largest church in the world, Longmont, Colorado. You know, I mean, I just thought, you know, originally I thought, here we go. This is it. Life for God. Miracles. The book of Acts, Christianity right here at Hopewell. Now, um, I, I've done my best to try to have the book of Acts, Christianity, and I think we're, we're doing all right, you know, but, but we could do better, of course. But the fact of the matter is, all this other stuff I had to learn about and prepare myself for when I was at Hiles Anderson College. And when I came here in 1994, though I never really understood the intensity of all of it, I understood basically what was going to happen. And as I matured in the Lord from age 25 to age 52, wow, just flip those two numbers around. I was 25 when I moved here and I'm 52 right now. Man, just, whoa, what do you know? I just not thought about that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I've matured in my life as a pastor and my Christianity, and I think I've grown in the Lord so that I handle things now a little bit differently than I did when I was 25, right? So, but the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of people that now, there's a lot of people who, let's, I want to be a preacher, boom, and they get right in the ministry. And the Bible says they're a novice. And one of the qualifications of being a pastor of a church is not a novice, lest Satan can trip them up, lest they get snared by the devil. And so here's the thing. If you want to live for God, please understand, I want you to live for God. I want you to follow him with your life. But don't let it be an emotional decision. Don't let it be, oh, life is great and wonderful and woohoo, here we go. No, take some time. It doesn't have to be years, like, you know, seven years for me to get ready to be a pastor. But take some time, count the cost. You know what Jesus is teaching us here? You want to live for God? You want to follow me with your life? It requires faith. It requires sacrifice. It requires focus. Now, here's what he says. Are you in? Are you ready? Are you, are you willing to live by faith? Are you willing to live a life of sacrifice? Are you willing to be focused singularly on the kingdom of God? And God says, all right, you can follow me. Now, by the way, some of us may look at that and say, whoa, that's hard. Yeah, it is hard. But the blessings equal how difficult it is. You know what I've learned over the years? The more the devil fights and I stick it out, the more that God blesses. God kind of balances everything out. There's that justice factor about life. You know, if you uh, sacrifice a lot for the Lord, he's going to give you a lot. If, you know, the Bible says if you, if you forsake all and follow him, he said, I'll give you a hundred times what you give up for me. It actually says that in the Bible. A hundredfold. Now, you have to be willing to give up for him. But he says, if you do, I'll give you a hundredfold. I, and I can show you that, that passage in the scripture. So all I'm saying is, it's a wonderful life to live for God. But it's foolish to, to make a decision to live for God based on an emotional high because you haven't counted the cost. So now let's focus on verse number 62, and I'll give you three points. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word fit means to be well-placed and appropriate. To be well-placed and appropriate. Do you remember when you were a child? I, you probably don't. Do you remember parents when you had a child that was a toddler and they had these little, you know, games that they played with and they were learning games. They would have these round pegs, triangle pegs, square pegs, and then they would have this board. They would have a round hole, a tri triangle hole, and a square hole, and they would have to find the right peg and put it in the right hole. Do you all know what I'm talking about? All right. So God says some of us are round pegs, trying to go into a square hole or a triangle trying to go into a circle hole, you know, a round hole. And, and it's, it's not fitting right. And so God says that's why we're not living for God successfully. It's because we're not fit. So you've got to find your place. You've got to be well-placed. And then you've got to be appropriate 
for God to use you, to be engaged in the kingdom of God. Now, if I'm going to live for God, I want to be fit. I don't want to be unfit. I don't want to be out of place. I don't want to be like, all right, I thought living for God was just going to be fun and games. And now it's not, so I'm out of here. No, living for God is not just fun and games. It's serious. It's a war. Now, you've got to be fit. So let me tell you three things that would make you not fit, all right? Because Jesus said, number one, the first thing is this. Write this down. Don't look back. Don't look back. So it says here, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So what does it mean, putting your hand to the plow and looking back? Okay, Sit up straight, I'm going to give you a history lesson. Back in the Bible days, when they plowed a field, they would have oxen. They would put a yoke around the, the, the shoulders of those oxen, and they would get harnesses and tie it to a plow. And then the farmer would stand on the back of the plow with the yoke and with the oxen in the yoke, and he would plow a field. When the, when the farmers back then would plow the field under those circumstances, the field would be massive. It would be big. They would put a post at the end of the field. And what they would do is they would get the oxen to go and they would hold on to the plow and they would look at that post the entire time they were going forward with the oxen and then they would be able to plow a straight furrow, a straight line. But so here's what Jesus was saying. The kingdom of God is work. It's like being a farmer. So he says, no man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You say, why? Because you're not going to plow a straight line. And God says the way of the Lord is a straight and narrow path. It's not crooked. It's not all over the place. It's specific and straight. Now let's get to some modern analogies. How many of you have ever driven a car on the road and you find yourself crossing the line from time to time? You're drifting. Do you know why you cross the line from time to time? You might be distracted with a cell phone. Maybe you're distracted with eating a Big Mac and trying not to spill it all over your lap. Maybe there's somebody sitting in the seat next to you and you're having a conversation with them and that distracts you. Maybe you're driving up to Estes Park or through the Colorado Rockies on Highway 70 and you're looking at the beauty of the mountains while you're driving. You'll find yourself drifting because you're not looking in the right place. In California, how many of you have ever driven a car in California? Guess what they have in California? They got bumps on all the roads. I mean, little, like on the yellow lines, they got these yellow reflectors. And so as you're driving down the highway in the lane, if you drift over the yellow line, bump, 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 it's supposed to say, hey, wake up, man, pay attention, you're drifting. In California, do you know, in, in uh, Colorado, do you know what we have? We don't have those bumps on the, you, you say, why don't we have them? Because you can't really plow for snow with those bumps. You'd be getting all the reflectors off all the time with the snow plows, right? And so the places in California that have those reflectors in the road, they don't have to plow for snow, and they can put them on there, and they basically stay there. But what do we have in, in Colorado? Well, here's what we have. We have a pavement, and then on the right side of the road, we have those grooves in the pavement. So if you start drifting on the right, it's you're like, hey, I'm drifting. I'm off. Get back in the line. Uh, I was out going to uh, Olathe, Colorado a couple weeks ago with my wife preaching up there in Olathe. And we were doing some sightseeing on the way. And every once in a while, or maybe not even sightseeing, but whatever, my wife was sitting there reading or something, and then all of a sudden, she, you know, we would hear this thrr, thrr, like that, and she'd go, I'm on the road, I'm on the road, and uh, she'd always be trying to tell me, watch what you're, you know, look where you're driving, you know, then she'd be like, oh, look at the beauty of these mountains, and oh, look at those trees and the colors, and that, you know, she'd go, no, no, not you, I'm looking at it, you drive, you drive, and uh, why, because we're not supposed to drift, if you drift, you might get into an accident, and it might be dangerous, right? So here's what Jesus is saying. If you want to serve me and get engaged in my kingdom and you put your hand to the plow, but you're not focused on plowing a straight line, a straight furrow, and you're looking back, you're not fit. He goes, I'm not interested in having someone in my kingdom that's constantly looking back. Now, what is it that we would be looking back at? 
two things. The world and our old life. The world and our old life. How many of you, when you got saved, you were an adult? Would you raise your hand? You were an adult when you got saved. I got saved when I was 10 years old. Do you know what my old life was? Probably not paying attention in class when the teacher was teaching. I didn't even have cell phones back then. My old life was throwing spit wads at people. You know, my old, old life was sneaking around trying to get away with, you know, simple things of life. Like eating a cookie when it wasn't the right time and hoping that my mom wouldn't ask if I ate a cookie out of the cookie jar while I had crumbs around my mouth. You know, hey, that was my old life, right? So there's not, you know, I got saved in 1980. There's not a lot about my old life that I look back at and think, oh, I wish I had that again. I don't look at my ages of six, seven, eight, nine years old and say, wow, those are great years. I wish I could go back. No, but what I do have a problem with as a temptation, as my flesh, is looking back at the world. You remember that song? Um, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Then the next court, next verse goes, The world behind me, the cross before me. Now, if you've decided to follow Jesus, you've got to make a decision not to turn back. But if you're not going to turn back, why are you looking back? You know, don't even look back. So we can look back at the world or we can look back at our old life, and if we live our lives like that, we're not fit. Let, let me give you a couple of, uh, couple of thoughts. Look at Luke chapter 17. Go to, we're going to look at three different passages here. Luke 17, and uh, look down, if you would please, at verse number 32. This is one of the most unusual verses in the whole Bible. Every time I look at it, I'm like, wow, good grief. You know, it's like amazing that God would even put that as a verse. But here's what it says. Are you in Luke 17, 32? Ready? Look what it says. Remember Lot's wife. Can you imagine being Lot's wife in heaven? <laughs> That's your claim to fame. Remember what she did? Don't do what she did. What did she do? Well, she was in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, her husband and her and her two daughters, and, um, and the whole city was just filled with homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, perversion, sexual perversion. It was just, I mean, like a total abomination and wickedness to God. And there's no denying that in the Bible. And God got so fed up with it, he says, I'm going to rain fire and brimstone down from heaven and destroy all of Sodom and all of Gomorrah. But Lot had to leave Sodom first, and God came to him in mercy and said, Lot, I'm going to kill everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah, but you're, you're my child, and I want you and your family to come on out, and then I'm going to destroy it. And they didn't want to leave. They actually wanted to stay and die with their friends. And the angels came and drug them out. So the angels got them and drug them out. So here's, you know, here's what God said. Go to Zoar and don't look back. So here they are, Lot and his wife and his two daughters. That's four of them. They're journeying to Zoar. Now they probably have their camels or donkeys or some type of animals with them. And they got their possessions, you know, whatever they could carry with them and, and pack and all of that. And whatever TSA would let them, you know, go through the metal detectors on us that's what i get to look forward to but anyway here they are going and then while they're on their way they're out far enough god rains fire and brimstone down from heaven and lot and mrs lot and the daughters heard the fire fall they probably heard the destruction of the of the structures and the buildings and the houses and the and the walls and they probably heard the screaming of the people and here's what Mrs. Lot did. She looked back. Why? Probably because she was sad that she had to leave. Probably because she was sad that her friends were now being killed by God. Probably because she wished she never left in the first place. And it angered God so much, he turned her instantly into a pillar of salt, and she died. 
And that was it. Are you listening to me? Lot and his daughters had to continue on to Zoar. The daughters without their mom and Lot without his wife. Why? Because she looked back. And you know what God says to us? Ready? In the New Testament? Would you remember Lot's wife? Why? Why should I remember her? Listen to me. So you don't look back. And God says, I'm done with you. Now, you probably won't be turned to a pillar of salt. That'd be kind of odd to go to church and have someone turn to a pillar of salt right in the pew. Woo! That'd be something else, right? So you probably won't be turned to a pillar of salt. But it could be that God says, all right, you're looking back. I'm done. I'm not going to use you anymore. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be a Christian and live the Christian life, I want to be active in the kingdom of God. I want God to use me. So I'm not looking back. Look back to the world. Look back to the old life. Let's look at another verse. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10. It's amazing how in the Scripture, God allows sometimes Paul, or whoever's writing the, 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 the epistle, to actually name the names of people who have left God. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Look what it says. For Demas, Paul's writing this, for Demas hath forsaken me. Now watch this. He didn't say Demas forsook God, but that's basically what he was doing because he was living for God. But Paul said, he forsook me. He was my assistant. Demas hath forsaken me. Now why? It says, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. You know what Demas' claim to fame is? He forsook Paul because he loved the present world. So what's the present world? Well, think about 2021. What is the present world in which we live in? It's all the thrills, all the possessions, all the things that as a United States citizen you can have in your life. It's not sinful things, but it's the present world. And whatever the present world is to us, in 2021, there was a present world to Demas. And here's what he said. Paul, you go on. I ain't going anymore. I'm going back to this present world that I gave up for my God. I'm going back because I love it. And Demas, listen, if you love, listen to me now. If you love the things of this world too much, you just might go back to it. Again, if you're a child or a teenager, are you listening? I'm not talking about going back to your old wicked lifestyle, but the things of this world, you're, you know, they're supposed to be in the rearview mirror. You're supposed to you know, look forward to the cross of Christ and go forward for him. But if you love this present world, guess what? You probably won't make it long for him. That's what happened to Demas. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at just Hebrews 10 and 11, and then I'm going to give you point number two. So look at Hebrews chapter 10. Now watch this verse. Woo! This passage, these two verses. Man, 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 man. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. Now watch this now. Hebrews is just a little bit over from 2 Timothy, just three books. Titus, Philemon, and then Hebrews. Now look at chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, that means going to hell, but of them which believe to the saving of the soul. So God says, if you draw back, you're not going to go to hell. But here's what he said. If you draw back, after you put your hand to the plow and you want to live for me, you draw back, you know what he says? I don't have any pleasure in you. You know what that means? God, your heavenly Father, will look at you one day and say, I'm disappointed in you. I'm disappointed in you. You know, as a child, one of the most painful things I went through growing up is when my mother looked at me and said, son, I'm disappointed in you. When she said that to me, boy, that just pierced my heart. I know there are some teenagers, you know, ah, I don't care. Dad's disappointed in me. Mom's disappointed in me. Whatever. Who cares? No, 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 no. Every makeup of every child wants mom or dad to be pleased with them. Everyone does. And I want my heavenly father to be pleased with me. That's why I'm living for him. And I know this, if I draw back, he won't be. My soul hath no pleasure 
in them or in him. Look at Hebrews 11. Look at verse 13. Watch this now. These all uh, died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now, in this passage, we're talking about the children of Israel in the Old Testament, those that lived by faith. It says they left that, it's talking a lot about Moses here, that they, or actually before Moses, um, um, Abraham there at the next, in verse number 17. But talking about the ones, uh, Noah, and then it says by faith, Abraham in verse number eight. So it's just talking about the, the people of God that lived by faith. It says this, they forsook a country and desired a heavenly country. And here's why they kept going all the way to the end. Look what it says in verse number 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So guess what? Your mind, there's some basic things that are portals to your mind. The two most prominent portals to your mind are your eyes and your ears, right? So what you look at, what you listen to, for the most part, is what your brain going to think about. Now, obviously, there's taste. You put something in your mouth, your taste buds will send signals to your brain. You'll think about it like, boy, this is wonderful steak. Man, this prime rib is out of this world. I had stroganoff, beef stroganoff today when I came home from church. And, oh, my, my, uh, my tongue was slapping the back of my, top of my mouth. And can't wait to, to, the roof of my mouth. Can't wait to get that, uh, eat that beef stroganoff. So, obviously, taste can affect your mind. And then touch, like your hands touching something. That can affect your mind. However, the majority of the time, your mind is affected by what you look at and by what you listen to. And you know what God says about these men and women of faith? They, if they had been mindful of that country that they had left, they might have had opportunity to go back. So why were they not mindful of it? Well, probably because they didn't look. <laughs> they didn't look back. Now, back then, they didn't, you know, they didn't have internet. They didn't have cell phones. You know, not a whole lot of listening, right? But looking back, it, wasn't, it never happened. They were focused on that heavenly kingdom, that heavenly country that they were going to live for. And so because they didn't look back, it wasn't on their mind because it says if it had been on their mind, they might have had opportunity to go back. You know why some Christians in this church go go back? It's because they look and then they think about it and then they're there. And if you don't want to go back to the world or go back to the old life, don't look. Because if you don't look, you won't think about it. If you don't think about it, you're not going to go. All right. Who is not fit? Or or, or if you want to be fit for the kingdom of heaven, what is it that you need to do? Number one, don't look back. Number two, write this down. Don't live foolishly. Write that down. Don't live foolishly. Turn over to Luke chapter 14. God explains to us. He gives us three analogies of what it is to live foolishly. Luke chapter 14, let's see here, and let's start reading verse 27. Luke chapter 14, look at verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For, now he's explaining what it is to bear your cross and to be his disciple. Now watch this. For. Which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth condition of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Okay, so let's give you some thoughts here. Jesus is saying, if you want to live for me and serve me and be engaged in my kingdom, number one, if you're going to be fit for the kingdom of God, 
Don't look back. Number two, don't live foolishly. Now, in this passage of Scripture, there are two examples of what it means to live foolishly. The first example is a man building a, a, a tower but not having enough material and money to finish it before he starts. So letter A, building a tower without enough material or money. That is foolish. Hey, I want to build a tower. Let's get started. And then you just start building with what material you have and what money you have. And then you run out of material. You run out of money and you stop. And the Bible says that is foolish because everybody is going to come by and look at you and laugh and mock you saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Look, he started, but he didn't finish. Why? Because he didn't properly prepare first. He didn't get enough material. Are you listening? He didn't get enough money. And therefore, he wasn't able to finish. The second analogy of being foolish is a king going to war without enough soldiers. He said, you know, you know why some people go to war? Here's what they do. Man, that king in that country really ticked me off. I'm going to go and fight him. I'm mad at him. It's an emotional decision. So they enter into a war for an emotional reason or because they're upset or they don't like what they did. And then they lose the war because they weren't properly prepared. Because he said, look, if you have 10,000 soldiers and they have 20,000 soldiers, have you figured out a way to defeat twice as many soldiers as what you have? Because if you haven't, you're going to lose this war. And he was saying a foolish king will enter into a war without proper planning and preparation and making sure that he has enough soldiers and has a proper game plan, no matter how many soldiers the other king has, in order to win the war. So you're a foolish king if you just simply go to war without proper preparation preparation because you're probably going to lose then God gave us a third analogy about what it means to live foolishly look over at Matthew chapter 16 Matthew chapter 16 after this passage I'm going to give you point number three which happens to be the very last point of my introduction <laughs> you didn't mean it all right Matthew 16 look at verse 26 we're just going to read one verse Matthew chapter 16, look down at verse number 26. Now watch this. This is another example of foolish living. Matthew 16, verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What is this foolish living? Here's what it is. Gaining the whole world but dying and going to hell when your life is over. How dumb is that? God says, what is it going to profit you if you become the wealthiest man in the world and have all the nicest things and houses and cars and you have all the fame and all the fortune and you live 80 years on this planet and you have everything that this world has to offer and then when you die, you spend eternity in hell. God says, that is so foolish. So foolish. So foolish. Do you know what 80 years of living on this planet in this life is compared to eternity? It's almost the equivalent, not quite because eternity is endless, but it's the equivalent of one drop of water in the Pacific Ocean. Why would we risk the entire ocean of water that's the Pacific Ocean for one drop? of pleasure. One drop. I mean, the whole world, all the pleasures of the world, the wealth of the world, the money, the possession, all of it, one drop compared to all the water that's in the Pacific Ocean. God says, you are such a fool to live for this life only and not live for eternity. That is such a foolish way to live. And you know what God says? If you want to serve him, don't live foolishly. Don't live foolishly. Number three and last, Write this down. You want to live for God? Don't abuse the system. Write that down. Don't abuse the system. Let me look at, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to see this now. This is the last passage of the night. I'll give you the thoughts, say some concluding words about this point, and then we're going to pray. Hebrews chapter 10. This is a passage of Scripture that some false teachers and preachers and false churches get entirely confused. And a basic understanding of words 
would clear everything up. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 26. How many of you are there? Say amen. If you're not there, say oh me. <laughs> I couldn't hear the oh me's, Bill. Amen was passed, man. You're supposed to say amen the first question. The second question was for oh me's. The ameners are supposed to be silent. Okay. All right, look at verse 26. We're going to read, read down to verse 31. Look at verse 26. Ready? For if we, now the word we is, is, in, 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 is talking about Paul and the Hebrew Christians that he's writing to. So this is a book, Hebrews is not written to unsaved people. It's written to God's people. For if we, those of us who are saved, sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. That means this, when you are taught what's right and wrong and you willfully do wrong. Okay, if, after you're saved, if you have been taught what good is and you choose to do something bad. Watch this now. Here we go. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now watch this. That's Old Testament, right? Every once in a while people say the Old Testament was, a, you know, the time period of wrath. The New Testament is the time period of grace. What is Hebrews in? The Old or New Testament? The New Testament, right? So look what he says about the New Testament, verse 29, of how much sore punishment. Okay, Moses, they died without mercy under two or three witnesses if they broke the law. But now in the New Testament, sore punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. You know what that says? This is the age of grace and we can do whatever we want. That's doing despite under the spirit of grace. Now watch this, verse 30. For we know him that hath said, that's God, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge who? His people, not the unsaved. <laughs> We're talking you and I. This is not judgment of the lost. This is judgment of his people. Now look what it says in verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right, so here's what God says. You want to live for me? Do not abuse the system. What does it mean to abuse the system? It's something like this. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven forever. I will never go to hell. So it doesn't matter if I live in sin now. I'm still going to heaven. God says, how much more sore punishment do you deserve than those who died without mercy under Moses? He says, you know the truth. If you sin willfully after that you've received knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now listen, some people take that verse and say, see, if you sin willfully after you, you've been saved, you're going to go to hell. That's what, have you ever heard anybody say that before from this verse? I have. You know what that means? That's foolish. That's dumb. That's stupid. That's ignoramus talking and teaching. Here's, here's what I'm saying. How many of you, I got saved in 1980, 41 years ago. I promise you, I willfully did something that I shouldn't have done at least once in those 41 years. How many of you knew better after you've been saved about doing something and you did it anyway and it was a sin? Would you raise your hand? All right, y'all get right with God tonight. Come down here. Uh, I'll put my clerical uh, uh, collar on and y'all start confessing. All right, here you go. But uh, no, but seriously, if, if that's the case, we're all going to hell then. If that's what that verse says, if you sin willfully after you receive a knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Hey, that means you're going to hell, bud, because every one of us has sinned willfully after we got saved. Now, that's not what it's talking about, though. Let me tell you what it's talking about. It's talking about punishment. Okay, I've used this illustration for years and years and years, and it fits so well, so let's use it again. I'm on Highway 25. I'm going 100 miles an hour, and the speed limit's 75. And the police officer sees me going 100 miles an hour. He comes up behind me, red lights, woo, blue lights, woo, pulls me over. Pulls over and says, sir, do you know how fast you're going? 
I said, well, my speedometer said 100. How much did you clock me at? <laughs> yep, you went 100 miles an hour. What's the speed limit? 75. Well, you know what that means? You broke the law. I said, okay. He says, all right, you're going to have to have a speeding ticket. I'm going to have to issue a citation, a speeding ticket. And I look at him and say, don't give it to me. Give it to Jesus. I'm saved. He paid for all of my sins on the cross. Jesus paid it all. Don't you know the hymn? So give the ticket to him. He paid for this when I got saved. It's all, it's all paid for. He'd be like, man, I'm thinking I'm going to haul you off to jail. Have you been drinking? Wait, wait. This is Colorado. Have you been smoking dope? <laughs> I, he may haul me off to jail. What does it mean that if I sin willfully after that I've received the knowledge of the truth there remain no more sacrifice for sins? Here's what that means. If I do something like speed and I get a ticket, Jesus is not going to pay it for me. I have to. That's what that means. So you know what God is trying to tell us? Don't abuse the system. There's a verse in Psalms. We don't have time to look at it because I am going to be done in the next minute or two. But there's a verse in Psalms where David prayed to God and said, Lord, deliver me from presumptuous sins. Do you remember that verse? Do you know what a presumptuous sin is? Here's what it is. I'm going to commit a sin that tomorrow I'm going to ask God to forgive me about. And because the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, I'll get forgiven. So today, I'm going to commit the sin knowing that tomorrow I'm going to ask him to forgive me, and he will. That is what's called a presumptuous sin. That means I am presuming that God is going to forgive me after I commit it. You know what that is? That's abusing the system. God says, sore punishment for you, bud. More than under the Old Testament and Moses. Because you sinned willfully and you thought it would be okay because of the spirit of grace. This is the age of grace, people say. And we're, we're going to heaven anyway. God will forgive me. I'll just sin today and confess it tomorrow. You ever heard the old saying, it's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission? That is a presumptuous sin. I'm going to do it, though I know God did not give me permission to. I'm going to do it, and then I'll ask him, ask him to forgive me tomorrow. And because he's a forgiving God, he will. Okay, great. If that's the way you live, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. You're not fit if you look back to the world or the old life. You're not fit to serve him if you're foolish in how you live. And you're not fit if you have the attitude that you can just abuse the system. Now listen to me very carefully. Every child here, I'm gonna conclude it right now. Every child, every teenager, every adult, you can live for God if you want to. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be popular. You don't have to be head and shoulders above everybody else. You don't have to have any of that. All you have to say to God is, I have counted the cost. I know I'm going to have to live by faith. It's a life of faith, sacrifice, and focus. And I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to live foolishly. And I'm not going to abuse the system. You know what God says? Come on up. Come on up. You can live for me. Let's do it. Let's go serve him. Tonight, are you fit for the kingdom of God? Decide to become fit if you're not. Why? Listen to me. Because it really is worth it. Again, that verse Okay, can you turn to it? Just one last verse, and I'm not going to preach it or anything like this, but I just want you to turn to it. Um, go to the gospel. Oh, good night. I hit the wrong one. Um, here we go. I just got to get the reference real quick. Oh! Uh, I thought it was a hundredfold. Hundredth. Is that a word? Oh, here we go. It's one word. Oh, okay. I thought it was two words. <laughs> Don't even know what I'm talking about. All right. Look over at Mark 10. Mark chapter 10. This will be the last verse. Don't laugh at me, Brother Bill. Oh, that was you, Jordan? Don't laugh. Bill, would you take care of your daughter for me? All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
All right, here we go. This is it. Are you in Mark 10? This is called overtime. If you're watching a football game right now, you'd think this is a great game because you went into overtime. Don't have an attitude of, I want to go home, get done. I will get done sometime. I got to catch a plane. I got to hurry up. Here we go. Verse number 29. Look at verse 29, Mark chapter 10. Ready? And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. All right? That's a life of sacrifice, right? Now watch this. But he shall receive, ready, an hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. You know what God says? If you do live for me, count the cost. And if you're willing to sacrifice whatever you give up for me and living for me in the gospel's sake, I'm going to give you a hundredfold now in this time. You know what that means? A hundredfold is 100 times. So if you give up, are you listening to me now? If you sacrifice one dollar for God, you know what that means? God's going to give you a hundred dollars in its place. If that's your sacrifice for him. If you give up a hundred dollars in sacrifice for him, we're talking just nu nu numerically right now, he's going to give you ten thousand. hundred times a hundred is ten thousand, right? If you give up a thousand for him, he's going to give you a hundred thousand. Now, that's how it's going to go. If you give up a land, he's going to give you a hundred. If you give up people in your life in, in sacrifice, li living for them, and you decide to live for God, he's going to give you a hundred times as much people in your life. That's what he's saying. And then he said, in the life to come, you're going to have all these eternal riches that will never be taken away. So listen carefully. It is good to live for God. There is a cost. You need to count it. But God promises if you live for me like I want you to, if you're fit for the kingdom of God, I will give you right now in this time, in this life, a hundredfold what you give up for me. I don't look at that as a bad proposition. You want to hold on to what you have and maybe not even be able to hold on to that? Or do you want to give it up for God and let God bless you a hundredfold? It really is worth it to live for God. If you're going to live for him, though, you've got to be fit for the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. It truly has been a joy to be in the house of God. Thank you for these people that have come. Thank you for the little bit of an extra 10 minutes in the sermon. And I think it was helpful and profitable. But, Father, please help all of us to be fit for the kingdom of God. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. As always, if there's anybody here that needs to be saved, please let me know. I can help you with that tonight. If anybody needs to be baptized, please let me know. If there's anybody here that God just simply spoke to you about being fit for the kingdom of God, please respond with obedience. Father, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will play. If you want to come, you come and pray. <laughs>